still like, hey, you can't you can't go around sending out um
all the bad energies.
Miss Liz, how are you doing? Elizabeth, can you hear me? You're on mute, just in case you didn't know, so I cannot hear you. Hello, Dr. K. How's everything been? Good? Yeah. Um... I'm better now. I was I was sick last week. But yeah. I'm good. I'm better. Okay, good. All right. How's uh is it cold where you're at? <laughs> yeah, it's cold. But I, I, I don't I don't really have to go out, so I'm not so affected. Okay, good. All right, good. All right, we're gonna start uh, shortly, just giving about five more minutes for the uh more people to show up. Okay, hello everybody in class. It, it just moved. Hi, Liz. Hi. Did you got what I have? No, um, it's different. I was given the wrong antibiotics and my body reacted and oh. it, my infection got worse, but I'm I'm feeling better. That's why I had to go, go to the ED. But I'm feeling better now. I don't have what you have. Thank God. <laughs> you thought you gave me over Zoom? You're not that lucky. <laughs> in your dreams in your dreams Hi, hey what's going on Riza everything's good yeah yeah how hey, about you everything good everything all right, Lisa. I, I don't expect anything less from you. So I, I don't expect anything less from you. <laughs> I should work on everything. No, you you good. You good. Thank you. So how was class last week? Was it peaceful with me not being around? What? Of course it was. <laughs> Are you saying that the class is peaceful when I'm not around? No, that's not what I said. You asked me if the class... Oh, but you said, of course. Yeah, I said, yeah, it was peaceful. It's always peaceful. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> is it not always peaceful? <laughs> I've never seen it. Mm. Yes, we missed you, Liz, okay? Of you course you missed it. That wasn't the question. Oh, Jesus, man. That is not the right response. <laughs> Be humble today, okay? We're getting close to Christmas. Let's, you know, humble. No? No? Nope. Like, nope, I don't know about being humble. <laughs>
Oh man. What well, a crazy place, man. What happened? No, people doing stupid stuff, killing people, and just it's a crazy world. Seems like there's a shooting. Someone injury. die. Huh? Did someone die? Well, there's a lot of people dying. But yeah, specifically, uh, an Uber driver. That's oh. that. A nice old lady. And then another Uber driver got tased. Why? People want money. Uh, when you have nothing, everything seems like a lot. <laughs> you know, even the smallest things seem like a lot. I think Thanksgiving, like there's a bunch of people just smash up an Apple store. Yeah. I was like, dude, right next door is a jewelry store, smash that one. Yeah. No. iPhone you get, you can't even activate it. You can't even sell it. And they can trace it. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about, you know, about these folks that are committing these crimes. I don't really logically think about this stuff. Yeah, like, just. Because of drugs? I'm not necessarily drugs. I just think that. Um, in general, overall, our society has got dumber, but specifically the United States. We've yeah. gotten dumber. So with that, that, is it? Yeah. Uh, Everywhere. Uh, what is it called? Idiotocracy. Oh, yeah, okay. Idiotocracy. Yeah, yeah. That's an old movie. That's an old with uh, yeah. Owen Wilson. No, with uh, Luke Wilson. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we just gotten dumber. And so, you know, the criminal is part, is an element of our society, right? It's a faction of our society. So they along also have gotten dumber. You know, thieves are not as smart as they used to be, right? Because we, they rely too much on technology that they don't understand. And then they, they, they do crimes that are related to technology, but they don't really understand that they can't move the technology because the technology is technology. We can lock it up. We can do whatever we want with it remotely. We don't, you know, you're basically just wasting my time. You know, you're wasting. Everybody's time. Yeah, you're wasting everybody's time. You're wasting a product at the same time. And you're more or less creating more fear than anything else. But at the same time, like, people have just gotten dumber. All right. And this is why it's important that, you know, you guys understand the value in the, the statement that you're making being in a doctoral program. Because the, the doctorate, at some point, is going to start to phase out as far as its, its relevance. It's not, it's not going to mean anything soon enough, right? Just when, like, high school used to be the thing. You had a high school diploma, you get any job. Then it was like you had to have a bachelor's degree, get any job. Then now it's like, oh, master's degree, right? It gets higher and higher, and then the degrees start meaning less and less because our society is getting dumber and dumber. You know, so people just do dumb stuff. Like, you're right. You can't move that stuff. What are you going to do with it? And you have to take it to somebody that knows what they're doing and they probably won't touch it. Sell, it. sell it for parts, sell it in another country. Yeah, you can. You can cannibalize it. You can sell it to another country. You can. I mean, if they have an international connection like that, yeah. they wouldn't just go smash and grab. They and don't. They That's right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, they don't have international connections. These are low level thieves. No real thief. You know, you don't see any arms dealers or real kingpin drug dealers or people that are really running real criminal organizations, the mafia. They, they really start from the streets. Yeah, they, yeah. And but you don't you don't see them doing smash and grabs like that. It's this petty thieves, people that you know aren't sophisticated and just robbing the the, the, the typical person who's on the street who has no defense. You know, yeah. that's all. They just banking on the fact that I may not have a gun to shoot you. And the person they are robbing is probably the worst off that. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing you never know. Never know. So ugly baby, as I like to say. All right, let's get started. Hello. Oh. Okay. So, so I just wanted to make an observation. Mo and I are always the first in class. We should get like a gift. Mo, what do you think? A gift? 
What kind of what kind of gift we talking about here, Liv? Extra credit. Extra credit <laughs> for coming to class. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the way the way the world is now, you're rewarded for just being present. So yeah. why not? Unfortunately for you, I was not born in this generation. That's, okay, that's the dumb word argument. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, so I don't I don't believe in that whole you know everybody gets a trophy <laughs> nonsense. Good evening, Doctor. What's going on? Okay, how you doing? I'm good. Please, I send you a text message. Thank you. I think, did you just now or? Just like five minutes. What'd you say? I'm going to be late. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I, I, the earliest I can get there will be like almost seven. The person I'm, that would take my daughter is held up in traffic and um, I'm just still waiting for her. Okay. All right. Well, you might as just sit tight and take the class over Zoom. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, no worries. I want to get back to this Liz conversation about points for being present. Mm -hmm. Which you, Liz, and you're not even here, Liz. Those are your extra points. You're in class, physically I'm here. Sick. You what? I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> Liz, you know, and you know you told me where you're at, right? Remember? <laughs> yes, but I'm sick where I am. Oh, okay, I got it. All right. <laughs> but then, if you weren't sick, would you come here? Would you come to class? I love your class, especially because I don't understand half of what you're saying. So I need to be there to hear it. <laughs> you guys are terrible, man. You guys are killing me. <sighs> I don't know. Maybe the holiday spirit will move me. <laughs> Maybe the holiday spirit will move me to, you know. A point, but as more people start to show up, your argument becomes less and less effective. Okay, how about this? My birthday was like two days ago. Oh, happy birthday! Yeah, yeah. Oh, are you 25 now? Happy birthday, but you didn't give us cake, right? <laughs> no cake, no nothing. I can send you a virtual one, like a cartoon. I don't like bites. Um, I'm 50 yeah, now. Yeah. Thank you, Moon. <laughs> Okay, move the only one that got a joke. Yeah. Okay. I don't like bites. That's all. Okay, how old are you now? Oh, you want to tell me because you're a lady. You don't want to say anything, huh? <laughs> like once you tell people your age, they either start to underestimate you or overestimate you or feel like you're still stupid for your age. <laughs> age I'm is not nothing but numbers. Ah, uh, yeah, it's nothing but a number. That's it. Okay, nothing but a number. Doesn't prove anything, does it? You sh I mean, sh I look, I'm talking. A doesn't prove anything, all right? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Okay, so. Just a number. Just a number, that's it. All right, any questions about anything? You know, it's week eight. So this is the last week you guys made it. Thanks so far, so good. Everybody that's here is uh, doing decent and passing the class, which I expected, okay? I didn't expect anything less from doctoral students, all right? Um, so basically, all you have is your project or your paper and the PowerPoint presentation, the video that goes with it, and then the uh, last quiz for this week, okay? So get that in. If you got any work that's from last week, um, that you want to submit that you didn't get a chance to submit, let me know. I'll open everything back up. Just for week seven, I'm not taking anything from week one through six anymore, unless there was a mistake or you know you wanted me to correct something that I missed. Then by all means, let me know. I will change grades and light up evidence or mitigating circumstances. But I'm not going to change except late work from weeks one through six. It's too late now. Okay, more work for me, and I can't afford it. All right. Um, aside from that, we're just going to do correlation linear regression today. Going to go over correlation uh, a little more depthly, and the linear regression will kind of raise over uh, real quick, just because, and I'm not going to really touch on multiple regression, just because um, you're really going to be using the software to do all this stuff, right? 
could we do it by hand? Yes, but it's a very lengthy process doing it by hand, you know, calculating the scope, getting the model, you know, um, it, it, we'll break it down for the components of the linear regression, but we're not going to do any examples, right? I'll breeze through the examples um, and just more of an understanding of the components and the elements that make up, you know, the equation for the line, okay? So that's about it. Um, and aside from that, if you got any other questions or anything else you need from me, you know, you got my email. Um, you can always email me, call me, whatever. Um, it is what it is, all right? No questions? No questions? Uh, I, could, I, I didn't understand the question for the group R&D for the week. Did you mean like the whole class should get together and, and make and make a video on each topic of each of the 10 topics. I didn't get that. Just like the way we do it, you um you pick a topic from what he has taught us, and that will be your presentation in your group. I, I hope I'm right. Yeah, I mean how do we you prevent said... picking the topic that other people have picked or something like that? You will discuss with your um part your teammates uh yeah. with these are the topics. This is a topic I'm gonna present. So you all agree on each topic and we'll present. Yeah, I'm gonna pull it up here. Let's see, got it here. Why is this? Okay. All right. Select so like a single topic out of 10 topics and um, three minute talk about the most important. Yeah. So basically you're just doing a summary of the topic you found the most interesting, but just in a group environment. Okay, so all of you, it should be one video, it should be one Zoom session, and you, you know, maybe each one of you pick, you know, a topic that you found interesting, you discuss it, you move on to the next thing. So I know you and Mu are on the same team for the most part for your um, research discussions. So maybe Mu picks correlation and you pick probability, and you talk about it. Okay, so don't uh, don't rack your brain on too much. Would there be PowerPoint with it, please? No, it's just a Zoom video. Okay, good. Yeah, just a video, no PowerPoint. Because right. you gotta do a PowerPoint for your your final paper. So mm -hmm. yeah, no PowerPoint. Just just do the research discussion, just a video. As you know, it's all the all the group research discussions have been videos. For the most part right so just make a video with your your group you know and just talk about if you, you know whatever topics you decided you like or don't like even if you don't like it like hey you know um i like i found the topic interesting but i i wish you know it would have been explained a different way right i'm not i'm not afraid of you know criticism and saying hey delivery is important right so if it if i didn't deliver it correctly or deliver it in a way that was you know good for you then that's okay for you to let me know that because then I can tweak my, my technique to apply the more generally to the class, okay? So just keep it simple. Don't, don't uh, break your neck about it. All right, let's get back here. Okay. So what just happened? Okay. Anyway, okay, so remember when we first started the class, uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, you know, I was discussing about, you know, what are really the things that we do with statistics, and statistics is really about trying to compare different, you know, populations or trying to find some association or some relationship between um, you know, different variables of different populations, right? So we kind of want to see what makes us different, but what also makes us the same, all right? And so we talked about the difference, right? When we did ANOVAs last week, okay? Analysis of variance. That really is where we kind of figure out what the difference is between, you know, um, you know means and, and populations and, and, and uh, standard deviation, all this other stuff, right? So this week, what we're going to do is correlation and linear regression. When we talk about correlation, we're really trying to figure out is there a relationship between two variables or two, you know, different variables? And how strong is that relationship? And is it a positive relationship or is it a negative relationship, all right? 
because we all have relationships in our life that, you know, you know, there's different categories of, of friends. You have associates, you have, you know, intimate friends, you have your best friends, you know, you kind of have your family, that kind of thing, right? So how are those relationships? Are they strong? Are they weak? Are they negative? There's some friends that I have that, yeah, they're my friends, but I don't necessarily hang out with them a lot because they're doing some stuff I'm not really cool with, right? Or they live in a different type of life. You know, same thing with me. They may say, hey, you know what? You're a nerd. I like to be in school all the time. I don't want to do other things. I got it. We're still friends. We just have differences, okay? But how strong or weak is that relationship, right? Is it, is it a positive relationship? Is it a weak? Is it contributing to, you know, who you are? Or is it detracting and, and bringing you down, right? So we try to figure that out. And correlation is one of those things that we use to figure out, you know, the strength of a relationship and try to figure out, you know, is it positive or weak aspect? What's up, Joshua? Um, All right, so there's, uh, they left those chocolate bags for you guys. So you can each grab one if you want. You know, mom, for you too. Thank you. If you want it, I don't, you don't have to take it. It's up to you, okay? Thank you. Liz, if you were here, you would get a chocolate bag, but you're not here. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say something because you know I like food, right? <laughs> I was just thinking about it. I'm like, God, I missed it. <laughs> no, no, I was saving it. Okay. So uh, we're talking about correlation now. It's a group of techniques to measure relationship between two variables. All right. So we're looking at example. Does the amount of help Tech spends per month, per month on trading its sales force affect its monthly sales, the number of hours studied for an exam, influence the exam score, right? We're really, at the end of the day, what we're trying to build is a model to predict, okay? That's what we're trying to build, predictability, right? Trying to see how, how well can we estimate the future, right? So when you look at, like, you know, weather forecast, hurricane forecast, or you know, the stock market or, or if somebody says, you know, in five years, we're going to be here. Those are all models built off linear regression, all right? Those are all models built off correlation, right? Because we understand what the components are, the elements that go into a particular, you know, uh, equation or particular formula. But then we, we need to understand what each variable contributes to the outcome, okay? So, so is correlation analysis the five way of AI? You can say that. Yeah, you can say uh, probability really is the factor of is the core of AI. Probability, not necessarily correlation. Probability more because probability is looking at the chances of a likelihood of something happening, and AI is more built on probability than it is correlation. So the under the hood for AI is not really looking for correlation, which is right. throwing at most mistakes. Yeah. Basically, yeah, we would, we're trying to, throw, you know, we're trying to, to paint a picture based on what we have, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, part of it is correlation, associ association, but just because it's an association doesn't mean it, it means anything, right? right. It, it may be a very weak relationship and really doesn't have a, you know, high degree of input into the outcome. So better yet, what I need to figure out is how likely is that element to occur? Right? Because if I know what the variance is or what is contributing to the model, then I all have to do is really kind of predict like what are the chances of that happening? Yeah, five percent. Well, if there's only five percent chance of happening, I really don't care about its strength. Right? I don't really care. I could I could probably take it out. Right? Which we have. We have what we call stepwise, you know, multiple regression. We put elements or variables in one at a time, see what the model looks like, and then we put another variable in, see what it looks like, we take one out. So there's different ways to do that, but that's a good question. But probability is really at the heart of um, um, AI and machine learning, right? Because we're really trying to figure out um, what's the likelihood of something happening, right? Again, trying to predict things, not necessarily looking for a relationship because the relationships can happen inherently on their own, depending on the algorithm you're writing. If you're doing something uh, we call K-means clusterings, right? And basically means like, if I'm looking for, like, let's just say, well, you guys, you guys don't know about anything about computer vision. Okay, so let's just say anybody here on Tesla, 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 no Teslas. Okay. Um, huh? In this bit, what's that? Tesla. Tesla. 
Elizabeth, you have a Tesla? Big money. I drive a hybrid, and whoever said that, I just know you just. Have you have a Tesla? No. You know I'm going to believe anything Joshua says. I'm going to believe him. Okay, Joshua said it. Joshua, I'll meet you outside after class. Be ready. <laughs> anyway, so the way that computer vision works, right? And I always oh, yeah, say Tesla because Tesla has, I can't remember how many cameras, 16 or 17 different cameras in it, mm -hmm. right? And the way it works is what we call LIDAR and radar, right? Everybody's familiar with radar, but not people are familiar with LIDAR. Okay, so basically it's light, right? And the way it refracts and the way the camera collects the, the light coming off different objects. So what happens is as the test the car is driving, right, in this direction, it's assessing what's on the right, left, front, and back. Okay. And sometimes, or even on your iPhone, for instance, right? Sometimes you'll have an image, right? But the image isn't complete. Okay, so now the computer, the algorithm has to decide, how do I fill in this missing part here? Well, guess what? I'm gonna go look at the nearest next pixel next to me, right? And then from there, I'm gonna look at the pixel next to it. And then I'm gonna look at the pixel next to, at, to that one, right? So I'm trying to recreate this missing part. More than likely, whatever is to the left and to the right, of that empty space is probably what the picture was. You see what I'm saying? No, all right. Well, I don't want to get too deep into it because it's not relevant. All right, it's not relevant at all. But when we do K-means clustering or we do um, like trying to, uh, all right, don't worry about it. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. Because I would need to explain a lot more. But good question, Mo. Okay. You got me going down a rabbit hole. All right. Because it, it, it pertains, but I just can't throw it at you like that because it doesn't make any sense for me to do it. I'm trying to think of a very quick way to do it. Well, you guys see how now the Samsung, Android, you can take pictures out, you can edit stuff, what they call magic erase. Have you yeah. guys seen that? Yeah. That is what we call computer vision, but that is done via um, K nearest neighbor or K means. So basically it, it takes that picture that you want to edit, it takes it out. But then what do I fill that space with, right? I'm gonna fill the space with everything that's next to it. All the images next to it are gonna start, I'm gonna start to fill the space up mm -hmm. that same color, that same, and now I have this new background that's based off of everything that was to the left, right, and to the top of it, right? Because before that, there was an image of you, but now I took it out, right? And so I need to fill the gap. What do I fill the gap with? The nearest things around, right? I create these clusters that tell me like, oh, this cluster of things is this particular picture. This cluster of things is over here. This cluster of things is over there, right? Is Siri listening to me? Uh, Siri's talking? Yeah. Samsung. Yeah, is that a Samsung? Yeah. Yeah, see, it's listening to me. So um, either way, um, so we look at correlation, we're really looking at trying to figure out the strength of the variables, right? And the way we graph it is what we call a scatter plot or scatter diagram, right? And so scatter diagrams are great because we have the X and the Y axis, right? And so I believe the X is um, independent and the Y is dependent. Okay, so in most equations, the Y is always the outcome variable. Okay, and then the X is, you know, the contributing variable or the variable that we're going to use that's independent. It's not, it's going to contribute to the outcome. All right. And so what happens is we have a certain thing, we're gonna plot it, right? We're, gonna, we're comparing two particular aspects of something. Sales and maybe uh, time on the road, okay? So time on the road is independent because 
that's going to have an impact on your sales. Okay, the more time you spend on the road, the more likely you get more sales. Maybe I don't know. All right, but either way, so you'll plot all your little data, right? Whatever, however you want, right? And then if you're trying to figure out if this is a true statement, right? What you want to do is you want to kind of grab these lines together, sort of, right? And try to see if you get any thing that makes sense, right? Because everything in our society is built on this. This is an imaginary line on every graph that goes like this. Okay, that, that is basically a straight line, the equation of a straight line, y equals mx plus b. You guys familiar with that? Okay, y equals mx plus b. Now, from time to time, they will switch up the variables. Or I should say y hat, excuse me. They'll switch up the variables, they'll do whatever. But at the end of the day, this is the equation for a line. Okay, this is your outcome. This is your... Um, your slope, excuse me, and this is your intercept. So basically what I'm saying is X is your variable, right? Just whatever it is, variable, okay? So what I'm saying is basically, my outcome is dependent on the slope. Everybody, does anybody know what the formula for slope is? Right? What is it? What's the formula for a slope? Uh, which form? Huh? Which form? What do you mean which form? No. X1 minus. No, just the regular, just rise over run. Oh, yeah, just rise over run. Okay. Rise over run. Okay. So when I say rise over, when, you, when we talk about a slope, what we're talking about is the rate of change. Okay. If Y changes two increments, how many increments does X change? Okay, that's what we're comparing. That's what the slope is, All right? So rise over run gives us the slope, okay? X is our variable, and B is what we call the Y-intercept, okay? It's that place where the X and Y meet. They intersect, okay? It's where X and Y intersect. Based so on your line. Huh? The line. They, the line. But yeah, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's where they meet. That's where they intersect, okay? So once we build the formula up, right, what we want to see if we're graphing region scatter diagram, right, is once we start graphing our data points, right, we want to see how close they are to this imaginary line here. The closer they are to the line, the more likely that they are related, that they have a strong relationship, they have a strong positive relationship. The further they are away from the line, the more likely that they are not related and there's a weak relationship, okay? So the other thing is that they could very well be like this. Right? You have all these data, and all these are data points that we would graph, right? If you can see that there's a trend, going up, right? Because for the most part, they're all, except for these two, maybe, the rest of them are kind of going this way, right? So I know there's a linear relationship here. I know that as Y does something, X is gonna do something else, okay? So let's just think about your shoe size or your shoes or whatever, or your clothes, right? As you get older, your clothes get bigger. The sizes you need get bigger because you're getting physically bigger, right? So there's a relationship. So I can tell if someone is 13, I'm going to expect them to be wearing this size shoe, okay? But again, that, there's more to that than just the age. There's the actual physical aspect of it, right? 13, but he's 6'5", right? Okay, that gives me more information to decide what shoe size is going to wear, okay? Or maybe, the, you know, she's 5'10 and wears size 9, 
okay? So you have a relationship there that I can use to help predict later on because the relationship they have is a strong, positive relationship, okay? Strong, positive relationship. But you can have what we call a negative relationship, all right? Basically, if you're talking about positive, right, okay? So positive is if they both go in the same direction. As one goes down, the other one goes down too. In a negative relationship, one goes up, the other one goes down, okay? So basically, if it's a negative relationship, they're going the opposite direction. If it's a positive relationship, they're going in the same direction. As one goes up, the other one goes up, right? The more school you have, the more money you make, right? That's how it should be. That's how it's supposed to go, right, for the most part. But not every profession is like that. Sometimes you have more education, but you don't make as much money. Or you don't have any education, but you make lots of money, right? Because of the field you're in. You know, maybe you're an entrepreneur, you know, you know, Bill Gates, he doesn't have a degree. Mark Zuckerberg, no degree. I don't think they ever went back and finished. You know, all these guys don't necessarily have degrees, right? But they're some of the richest people in the world. Okay, so you see how there's a positive or a, a negative correlation to school and income for them. Right. So you would do that kind of study. But the whole point with scatter plots is that the closer it is to the line, the more likely you have a strong linear relationship, right? Because one is affecting the other and they're going in the same direction, or one's affecting the other and they're going the opposite direction. But there's a strong relationship. Okay. So a scatter plot or scatter diagram is one way that we use to um, excuse me, label this stuff. As I said, X is the predictor, also the independent variable. Y is the outcome variable, a dependent variable, okay? And I said before, right? So now you have an idea about how you would take this data here and compare it, okay? Because once you graph it, you can start to visually see what the data is trying to tell you. Because right now, just looking at it, I, I really can't tell anything. But once you plot it, you start to see a picture. You start to see, oh, okay. So the more calls you make, the more copies you're going to sell, right? And then so I can go back and say, you know what? I need you on average to make 100 calls a day because I know that more than likely that's going to result in 50 sales or 50 copies sold, okay? But it's all a model. We're trying to predict something, right? So here's a scatter diagram, here's an example. Copy of sales, copies of the business, all throughout US and Canada. Uh, sales manager print for an upcoming sales meeting and like to impress the sales rep. Takes a random sample of 15 sales reps and gathers information on the number of sales calls made last month and the number of copies sold. Develop a scatter diagram of the data. Okay. So sellers can make more calls, tend to sell more copies. But you can see based off the data we just saw of the table, now it's plotted. You can see that everything is kind of in an upward trend. You see what I'm saying? So if it's going this way, it's a positive relationship. If it was a negative relationship, right, it'd be going kind of this way, sort of. You would you, you'd be able to tell that it's going from here and it's going this way and not this way, okay? Because if you start looking at the predictor, right, you look at the outcome and you say, okay, as I go down the lane, 280 calls, so basically 80 copiers. So the more calls I make, the more copies I sell. All right, you can see it clearly here. 70, 60, and all that stuff, okay? So this is just a good example of a scatter diagram and how you can use it to, you know, um, de uh, visualize the data and get some understanding as to what's going on. I don't even have to do anything else. I already know there's a positive, a strong positive linear relationship between these two variables. And I would say, you know what, I'm going to build a model off of this, All right? And I would just say, hey, you know what, let's just run a quick model and just say, hey, on average, you know, I, I find out what the average, you know, calls are as compared to the average sales. And I'll say, hey, do 50 calls a day. 50 calls a day, on average, at the end of the month, you're going to end up with 100 copies sold, All right? And that's how they do it. 
All right, that's how they do it. Not that simple, but in essence, that's the premise behind it. All right. All right, so what we have when we're trying to do a correlation, we have the correlation coefficient, right? So basically the correlation, co correlation coefficient is what we call R or rho, which is, I think I should be familiar, I guess, with it. And this is something you're definitely going to use in your dissertation if you're doing a quantitative analysis, okay? Because this is the, the, the bare minimum statistical analysis you will do for your research if you're doing quantitative study, even if you're doing a mixed method. Correlation is the basic because you want to establish if there's anything to look at. Yeah, do I even have a relationship? Is it worth looking at? Is it, or should I bother, right? So we have what we call R, okay? Which is really rho, because you know it's pronounced rho. It's also equal to what we call Pearson's correlation um, something, I forgot. But it's basically Pearson's correlation, and there's another thing called Spearman's correlation, okay? So Pearson's correlation is what we traditionally use, all right? Spearman's correlation is what we use when we have um, a non-parametric data set, okay? So basically, the data set has, does not follow the assumptions of uh, statistics, right? There's five or six assumptions that we have in statistics that we use in order to just do our, our stats. But we also understand that there's going to be data that is not necessarily normally distributed, right? It's not, you know, clean and, and just, you know, there's homeostasis, I can never put out there, homeostasis, there's uh, multicollinearity, there's a lot of things that go into, you know, a model or a set of data that sometimes doesn't fit into a normal distribution. So sometimes you get data that looks like this, all right? Or, or even this, or this, or it's flat, right? Or it's, you know, skewed left or right, or positive or negative, I should say, right? We always want this, but we don't always get this, okay? Sometimes we get this, sometimes we get this, sometimes we get that, all right? This is when you experiment correlation because it does, it does, it assumes that the data does not follow any of the assumptions, right? The rules, and so we have to use a different type of correlation. But for our intents and purposes, a person's correlation normally works because we automatically assume that most data is normally distributed and falls within the assumptions of statistics, okay? So there's five, yeah, five or six different assumptions that we just assume, like, okay. You know, just like last week, we assumed that the variance of the sample, the population, was good enough to use if we didn't have the standard deviation, right? Same thing here, okay? We make these assumptions about it, so, right? So it creates this correlation, which is the R, okay? We also have what we call the R squared, right? And the R squared basically measures the variance or the contribution, I like to say, uh, contribution of a particular variable, right? So when we have an output, we'll have the R, right? The R tells me how strong the relationship is. And the R goes from negative one to positive one, okay? Negative one to positive one. Negative one tells me it's a negative, but perfect relationship, okay? It's perfectly linear relationship. Positive one, or oh, one, yeah, positive one tells me it's a positive linear relationship. So what I'm saying here now, like I said before, this is telling me that one is going up, one's going down, this one's telling me they're both going in the same direction, okay? Be it up, down, whatever, but they're both going in the same direction, okay? Negative one means opposite directions, oh, sorry. Excuse me, guys. Opposite directions, positive one means same direction, okay? Negative correlated, positive correlated. In between there, you have negative 0 0.02, you have 0.3, you got 0.7, you got all this stuff, right? So traditionally, 
zero to zero point two is a weak relationship. Okay, it's weak. Okay, uh, point three to point six is a medium relationship, medium strength relationship. Okay, point seven to one is a strong relationship. Okay. And it, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Was, was that a positive 0. 0.7, 0. 0.6, or negative? I, I can't tell. So it's 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 a it's a positive. Plus or minus? It's a it's, it's yeah, it's plus or minus. It doesn't matter. It's absolute value in this one, right? Because remember, I said that when it comes to statistics, the plus or minus only denotes direction. It doesn't denote value, it just denotes direction. Okay, so these values I'm showing you right now are absolute value, but if, if they had a negative in front of them, all they're saying that it's a negative relationship, right? But it's still a strong negative relationship, but it's still a weak negative relationship. You see what I'm saying? So it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, but the range is negative one to one, right? All you're worried about really is the actual numbers. And then if it has a negative in front of it, you know, hey, the variables are going the opposite direction. One's going up, the other one's going down, or one's going down, one's going up, but they're in opposite directions, all right? So that's what really the negative does for you, tells you. But these rules here, it doesn't matter. You know, weak, weak, weak. It could be, I could write it this way. Oops, here. Still be the same thing, okay? It just tells me that's negative. Okay, that's all it tells me it was one one variable is going, you know, X is going this way and Y is going this way. That's all that's telling me. Okay. So you understand the relationship between those two, right? So if the range is from negative one to one, right? You have either negative, perfect negative relationship or perfect positive relationship. Okay. If it's a zero, then there's nothing there. No association, all right? So we don't that those two are related. Nothing to look at here. Let's move on, okay? Um, like I said, value near one indicates a direct or positive correlation. The value near one indicates a negative correlation, all right? So not too difficult here, all right? Any questions so far? Everybody good? Okay. So, all right. So here's the correlation coefficient graph, okay? So as I, I, I was telling you, right? You have negative one, she has per, perfect and negative correlation. Pilot perfect correlation, 0.5, right? It's moderate, moderate, right? And there's zero, no correlation. So as you fall into these ranges, you have to figure out, you know, where do you fall? Weak, medium, or strong, okay? You could have a, a very weak relationship, but still move on and say, you know what? It's still, there's still a relationship there. It's not strong. So then that tells me like this contribution, whatever this variable is, it's probably not going to impact my outcome very much, right? Because it doesn't have much of a relationship with whatever I'm, you know, doing, right? So if I'm looking at my, um, let's just take the school, for instance, right? Name me, give me one thing that you think doesn't really factor into your grades that we count. Something we count, but doesn't really have any impact on your grade. Attendance, thank you, all right? Attendance, has no impact on your grade, right? It's a weak relationship to your grade. So if you don't- I come see what you did there. You see what I did there? You like that, Liz? Because of the discussion Mu and I were having with you earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you did. <laughs> and I still admit what I can. Huh? I think that's why she should be missing. Yeah, you know, hey, look, Joshua was, yeah, he's throwing you out there. The bus is running you <laughs> over. You don't worry, Joshua. Make sure you have your gloves on. <laughs> so, your tennis has nothing to do with your grade, right? That's why it doesn't really matter to me if you come to class or not. Okay, I want you in class, but 
It doesn't mean that I just check the box. Okay, hey, you're not going to come to class. Thank you. I appreciate it. I just want to build professional courtesy, but all of you are pretty courteous and, you know, respectful. So it's like, hey, I'm not going to come to class. Okay, I don't even know why. Because it has no impact on your grade. What I care about is whether you understand what's going on and you do the work, you submit it, because that is going to impact your grade. Attendance, who cares? Right? A weak relationship. It's almost zero. It's pretty much zero. Right? No association. Right? And so this is where it makes a difference. So you have to kind of figure out, okay, once you get your correlation uh, calculated, what type of relationship do I have, okay? And if I have a, a decent relationship, then my next step is to do a linear regression. Now I want to see the severity as to which, or the, the degree as to which each variable is contributing to the outcome, right? So let's just say, again, we go back to your grade, okay? Your grade is the y hat. That's your grade. But your grade is made of what? Attendance. Not really. All right. Plus, what else? Learning, Learning engagement. All right. Plus what? Squares. Plus what? Paper. The final paper, right? Let's just say. Let's just leave it there, right? Each one of these things has a different contribution. To what degree? Do they contribute to the outcome to your grade? Okay. Yes. That's no. That is correlation, but the degree to which they correlate, they contribute to the grade is our R squared. Okay. So basically, you take the R and you square it, and it gives you the contribution, the variance for each thing. Right now, each. One is going to have its own R when we do multiple regression. This is this is an example of multiple regression here because I have many variables here, right? We're just doing simple linear regression. It just be one thing. It'd be attendance and then the grade, okay? But we do multiple regression. We look at deeper things. And for you guys, when you know your research, you're going to be doing multiple regression, right? It's probably, probably not just going to be one variable. It's going to be many variables and it'll be outputted, right? But you can tell how much each one contributes to the outcome by squaring its particular correlation score is R, okay? That way, more than likely, this would be zero, right? Plus the LEs, let's just say the LEs contribute to 10%, right? So 10% of the variance can be attributed to LEs, right? The quiz is 15%, and then the final paper is 75%, right? So now I basically, oh, let's not make it 75, let's make it 70%, right? So now I basically know that 90% of your grade, or no, 95% no, uh, of your grade can be accounted for by LE, quiz, and final paper, okay? And attendance, but attendance is not important, okay? And so I still have 5%. Where I don't know where it's coming from. All right. So that's what really you get out of all this. But the important thing to remember is the R, right? And how do you calculate the R? And which we'll get to. All right. So, what we got here? All right. Call it, coefficient R, all right? Use American uh, copy of sales as an example. We begin with a scatter diagram, but this time we'll draw a vertical line, a mean value of x values, and a horizontal line, the mean of y value. Okay, so all right. So what they did was basically they got the average of the sales calls and the average of the copiers. So, okay, where they meet is your y-intercept. Okay, this little spot right here, right? 45 you know, whatever that is, 98 or whatever is your y-intercept, okay? But we're not worried about that right now, right? 96. But yeah, 96, basically, yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Reading is fundamental, right? Okay, so, but you can see what they're doing here. They're trying to show you like, okay, once I get the average of each, right, and I graph it out, now I can really tell what's going on, right? I can see there's a slight trend up. Okay, based on the means of both particular 
aspects, right? So in each quadrant, it represents something. It's easy to tell what it is, okay? So quadrant one, strong positive correlation. Quadrant two, weak positive correlation. Quadrant three, strong negative correlation. Quadrant four, weak negative correlation, okay? So each quadrant represents the strength of a relationship. Now, this is just based on this data. That's it. So you can see kind of where everything is going. It's going in this kind of this straight line over here. Are you, do, you, do you call them weak because of the dots? Call them weight, you said? Uh, you call them one and four and two. Oh, yeah. Because of the dots? No, it's, it's typically, in general, just don't worry about the dots. Okay. Let's say there were no dots. If you break it up, if you split it into four categories, four quadrants, mm -hmm. that's what each quadrant is. Because if the higher you go here, that means that it's going this, this way, right? That oh, means there's a positive, oh, okay. right? If it's down here, then it means something else. If it's over here, it means something else, it means something over here, right? So here, you know, a lot of the dots are here, but they kind of go in this direction, okay? So I know that there's a positive, strong part of correlation because they're very close to the line. Right. If I look at each line and see where the dots are, they're very close to the line. Okay, close to the line. So I know that they are probably correlated, have a strong relationship. Right. And that's the good thing about having a scatter diagram because you can really see it visually very quickly on what's going on. So we have coefficient uh, R. Okay. And then to calculate it manually, this is the formula. Okay. So R equals the sum of X minus the mean of the X of the sample, well, the mean of the X, times Y minus the mean of the Ys, divided by N minus one times the slope of X times the slope of Y, okay? So basically, if we were doing it by hand, this is what it would look like for one problem, okay? You have to take this formula, and apply it to every x and then add it up, right? Apply it to every x, apply it to every y, and then add those two things up. After you multiply them, you add them all up, okay? Yeah. But we're not going to do that by hand, but I want you to understand what's going on. The slope of the x, um, they may have calculated, they may have not. Oh, they did, uh, M minus one, 42.76 and 12.89, right? It's a slope of um, the x and the slope of the y. The x will be by half. Yeah, the no, the textbook, they, they didn't do it by hand. They yeah. <laughs> yeah, they put a spreadsheet in there, yeah. It's it's really tedious to do it by hand, and it actually is it's not, um, it's not, it, you can't really do it with a big data set. It just, it would take you forever to do it with a big data set. So you use the software, but I want you to understand the components of what's going on, okay? So basically, all you're doing is taking the rise over the run, and then you figure out what the slope is, um, and then you kind of form, uh, follow the formula, right? And in, in most instances, there you probably have to figure these two things out, but everything else you'll have. They, you, they typically give you all the information, or they'll just give you, you know, they'll give you this, and they'll say, build me a linear regression. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is get your R, all right? You're going to figure this out first. And then once you get your R, then, you know, worry about that later. Then you're going to testing the significance of the R, right? And we'll do, you know, hypothesis testing on the R too, just like we did last week. Nothing's changed, same process, okay? We're going to use the T-test because one, we have a small sample, okay? That's always an indicator. We have a small sample, all right? And the t-test is typically used for testing the R, okay? If you use a correlation, all right? So we use a t-test. Same thing, we state our hypothesis and our no, uh, alternative and our null hypothesis, right? And because it's equal sign, we know it's two-tailed, right? And then we go, we pick our significance level, we go on 0 0.05, we select the t-test, which is t, right? Or select the test, excuse me. 
from the decision rule, reject HO if T is less than 2.160 or greater than 2.160. So basically, if it's falling between negative 2.16 and positive 2.16. Okay, that's all it's saying. All right. Make a decision and reject HO if T is equal to 6.216 because now we've gone down here, we've calculated our T, right, based on the T test for correlation coefficient. Okay. So once you figure out your R, then you can go ahead and do hypothesis testing on your um, on your data set based on the R, okay, based on the correlation to see does this correlation help me prove my hypothesis, right? Do I reject or accept my not, my hypothesis based on the R, based on the relationship that the, the R is giving me? Okay, so if the R was what was the R for this one? Uh, 0.262, right? So this is a very weak relationship, right? Because it's over here, right? It's less than 3.3. .3. It's a weak relationship, okay? So we know that, right? But we want to test it, okay? So now, but yes, man. This under yes. universal rule. No, it's their the rule, the standard rules. Um, you use your own initiative or in the standard? Every no, the standard everywhere. Every yeah, this yeah, this is this is a rule for the most part, right? Just to give you kind of it's it's a loose set of rules, right? Because you have to be really look at it and say, okay, I got 0.2, it seems weak, but then there might be some other things that are like, oh, you know what, let me throw this in there that might strengthen the relationship so that it, it increases, you know, if from weak to medium medium, right? But in general, this is the, the rule of thumbs that we use, right? Zero to point two is weak. 0.3 to 0.6 is medium, 0.7 to 1 is a strong relationship, right? All right, um, go back here. All right, so basically 0 0.05, we go back to our, you know, our book, we go to our T table, okay? And we follow the formula. And this formula, if you notice that T is equal to R times the square root of N minus 2, right? Because it's N minus 2 degrees of freedom for this particular test, divided by the square root of one minus R squared, right? So we looked at the variance, right? The R squared and, and the input that's provided. So we just go through, and the first thing we look for, 0 0.05 is two-tailed, all right? So 0 0.05, two-tailed, okay? I go down, I calculate the degrees of freedom, what they use is an N. They use 15 as an N, so 13 and 0 0.05, 2.16, right here, okay? So I got 2.16, so now I have my range, right? I've calculated my range, my critical values, okay? So out here, I reject the null. In here, I don't reject the null, right? Same thing from last week. The null is good in here. Out here, we gotta go to alternative, okay, in the text. So, so if we look at what happened here, we got a T equals 6.216. That's greater than 2.16. That means the land way over here. So now we can say there is correlation with respect to the number of sales calls made and the number of copies sold in the population of salespeople. Okay. So there is a correlation. Okay. Um, and it's, let me see. Although it's a weak one, oh no, actually the, the example they use is pretty strong. All right, the number they use, they keep they keep changing numbers. I wish they wouldn't do that, which they would stay consistent with the numbers. In this particular example, they use 0.865 for the R. That's a very strong relationship because it's far between 0.71, right? So again, as you do the testing and you do the, the hypothesis testing, it proves that yes, there's a correlation with respect to, all right? So, just because there's a correlation doesn't mean there's causality, all right? There's a difference. Association is one thing. Causality is different, something different, all right? This is kind of where we get to linear regression and multiple regression when we're talking about causality. Can't really do causality. Right? Huh? can do causality if there's regression. You can. You can, because that's what it is at, in the essence, at the end of the day, right? Because what I'm saying is that I have these elements and they're contributing to the outcome. 
right? So all these oh, elements, right? You have right. To pick up that experiment. Right, yeah, something. exactly, right? I have all these, I have this model, right? And this model is helping me predict, right? So if A, B, and C happen, it's gonna cause Y to occur, right? And so it's, it's, it is a form of causality, or you can, you can assume causality a multiple regression and linear regression because it's, it, it's providing you with a model for predictability, all right? You can't say for certain that's what caused it, but you have a high degree of, you know, confidence in your results. Down yet? No? How do you get rid of the whole cause of something? For example, ice cream cell mm -hmm. and skin cancer rate. Right? Are positively guarded. Yes. But the common sense dictates that they are eating ice cream doesn't really cause. You know, right. This, right. But because they're both caused by something else, and the study didn't even mention, right. which is maybe the hot weather. Right. right. So with Cardish analysis, you can't get rid of that factor because you don't know what it's about. Right. Yeah. You don't, you don't necessarily want to get rid of it, but that's, that's is where you have to figure out what is the contribution of that particular variable. To the outcome, right? Yes, ice cream sales and cancer are correlated, are highly correlated, but does it mean that ice cream, you know, eating ice cream, like you said, causes cancer? No, it doesn't. Or maybe it does, but not directly. Right? Huh? That's a particular degree, you know, of impact. Yeah, right. This is where we have, we have direct relationships and indirect relationships, right? Indirect impact and in, 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 in interaction, right? So using Moon's example, yes, there's a correlation between ice cream sales and, and cancer, right? But we know that the, it's not the ice cream, okay? We know that, but what is it then? Well, it's cause people come out to eat ice cream during the summertime when the sun is out and they're just sitting there and the sun is beating on them, right? Mm -hmm. But what caused them to come out side? Yes. The ice cream, all right? The ice cream may be a contributing factor to why they came outside. They could have been at the mall. They could have been anywhere, right? They saw the ice cream and they went to get the ice cream. That's why it's not 100%. This is why I kind of think when Moon's saying, oh, you know, you can't really assume causality based off the regression. Right. And you can't. Like, you can't 100%. What you're trying to do is just trying to get as close as you can to using it to help you establish some causality, right? I gotta know what what you know what made it happen. Right. It will start looking for something. Right. It will start looking for something. Yeah. Right. You can never assume 100 percent causality. Right? There's just no way. Unless you test for it. For Unless example, you test for it, there's only one way you can assume causality. Well, it can disprove causality. You can, can, yeah, you can disprove you can put a bunch of people in a Dark room and yeah. you feed them ice cream, and if they don't get skin cancer, then, then yeah, then you know it's not it, right? But there's there's one way to prove causality. Experiments. It's not when you say experiments. What do you mean? You test for it. Test specifically for that factor. You test for it, but what? But what are you doing when you are testing for it? Like when you do research, what are you doing? Like who? So. If you're doing research, examining something. you're examining something, right? But the key is that you're doing it yourself. You can see it, right? right? I know, like if I walk, if I go here and I pull the door and it hits me in the eye and I have a black eye, you know what caused that. You saw it, right? But if you had your back turned and I hit my eye, you didn't see me do it. You didn't see the door hit my eye. You can't assume that the door did it. Right, I could open the door, and then Dr. Bastard could have punched me in the eye and then closed the door. Right, but you can't assume; you have to see it. That's the only way you can assume causality. You have to actually see what it. Yeah, and even then, you can't really trust your eyes. It's fundamentally, it's a qualitative study. Right? Yes, you have to do a case study and you say, "Hey, this happens this way." So right. in this case, it caused that. Yeah. Right, you got to go more in depth, right? And a qualitative study is, is definitely more in depth than a quantitative study, all right? Um, but we, you know, when we start looking at correlation, many times students and people mix correlation with causality. 
Just because they're associated doesn't mean that one made it, the other thing happen, right? And then you have to make sure you stay away from that, all right? Until you get to regression and models, okay? Because we know what causes hurricanes. What we don't know is what direction they're gonna go in, intensity, right? Those things come after time of gathering different data on multitude of variables, and then we say, you know, with 90 degree certainty, this hurricane is going to cut across Florida, it's going to hit Tampa, then it's going to go to the left and then come back across to the right, right? That's after new, like large amounts of data, right? Being put in and a pattern being formed, a model being formed that we can help to predict what's going to happen, right? So I can say air temperature, water temperature, um, you know, um, geographical, you know, uh, conditions, um, you know, uh, barometric pressure, whatever, all contribute to a hurricane occurring, right, for the most part. Now, there might be some variables out there that we're not familiar with, but, you know, for the most part, we know what causes hurricanes, and we know how to predict them pretty well and what direction they're going to go in, but it comes from large amounts of data, you know, whether or not there's a low pressure system, a high pressure system, which ocean, which body of water is it going in, right? You have to think about like we never have, we don't have hurricanes in California. Why is that? Because of the what happens? Mountain? No, it could be the mountains too. But there's one, there's one main reason why we don't have hurricanes in in California, which may be changing soon, but for right soon. now, huh? It may change. The hurricane is afraid of paying taxes. I'm gonna need you to leave, Liz. I'm gonna need you to go. I'm gonna just need you to go. You must still be sick. <laughs> the hurricane, the afraid of paying taxes, huh? <laughs> is the hurricane called Liz? <laughs> the water's too cold. The water's too cold. The Pacific Ocean is too cold. The, the temperature of the water is too cold. That's why we don't have a hurricane here. Are you yeah. Because the water temperature has something to do with how hurricanes form. That's why we don't have hurricanes here. On the other side of the Pacific Ocean, they will have hurricanes. Where? Taiwan. That's why it's called typhoon. Yeah, but it's, that's a typhoon. That's something different. Is it different? Yeah, I mean, from a hurricane? Yeah, it's different. It's a different. Like hills ocean? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if, they, if I know it's different criteria for them. And for me, you, maybe anybody that's not a meteorologist or doesn't study that stuff, you know, it's all the same, but I know they're different. Yeah, they're definitely different. Yeah, they're definitely different, but the same. Probably the same things go into assessing a typhoon as compared to a hurricane to a monsoon to you know tornado you know all those things but specifically for California we don't have hurricanes because of the water the temperature of the water here in the Pacific is cold now the temperature and I said that it could change because the temperature of the water changes so as Moon was saying near Taiwan Japan it's on the Pacific Ocean but the water is warmer there the Pacific Ocean water is warmer there, okay? Or the conditions that the Pacific Ocean is, is okay for typhoons or monsoons. That's why they don't call them hurricanes. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're also on the Eastern Seaboard. Right, they're, they're yeah, there. kind of sort of, right? Because we always yeah, forget it's a circle. Yeah, I said, I just thought about it. So yeah. you think about the only place that has hurricanes is on the east side of the- East Coast, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Hobo Africa. No, 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 sorry, no, 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 hurricane no, no, Africa. Yeah, it just, it just, the, it's, it's the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean has the right condition. It's warm, right? The Gulf of Mexico, warm, right? When we go to Mexico, it's warm water, right? You go out here to Mission Bay or any place, it's freezing. Like, I don't swim, I don't go to the beach here. I go to the beach, but I don't go to swim. It's too cold for me anyway, mm -hmm. right? But when I'm on the East Coast, I go back home, I'm in the water all day because it's warm. You went out of Florida, the water's hot, right? It's like we're taking a bath, right? Over here, you freeze. There's no hurricane here. 
upper east coast uh, like new york no there there is yeah oh. yeah it, it goes up there just that as it gets further up because it's coming such a distance it weakens it turns into a tropical storm and that kind of thing right but the, you know the other thing about you know weather is that you know a lot of people don't realize like there's earthquakes in new york really yeah New York gets earthquakes, okay? A lot of the East Coast get earthquakes, okay? So a lot of people don't understand that, but either way, all those models are built off of linear regression and understanding, you know, how we look at the relationship between the two and then decide, okay, we want to look at the factors and what the contribution is to that particular model. Because I may say, yes, this is, you know, it's correlated, but does it really have an impact on the outcome? Is it really important for me to consider? Like, no, I don't need to consider it. The, the output, the, you know, the, the impact is minimal. I need to look at the other factors that have a higher R squared that may have a higher contribution to the outcome, right? My LE, my quiz, you know, um, my final project, right? That's why it doesn't really hurt you too much. You lose a point or two of your R, your research discussing. Because at the end of the day, you know, what's the max number of points you could probably lose on your research discovery? Research discovery, you lose a point every week, eight points, right? As compared to your final, right? As compared to the quiz or something like that, where there's more uh, of a, you know, high degree of impact. And so you lose more points because it's, it's worth more. The weight is higher. Okay, that's all. So, yes. Um, Correlation is change, checking the relationship, mm -hmm. while uh, regression is checking the, the degree of impact. Yeah, well, regression is more about building a model of predictability, right? But what you get with the regression is the ability to identify how much impact. that variable inputs or impacts the outcome, right? What's the variance really is what we're looking at. All right, what can we account for? Like for the quizzes, we can account for 60% of the grade, right? That's gonna affect 60% of the grade, but attendance is gonna account for 0% of the grade, okay? So when we look at correlation, we just gotta understand, is there being a relationship? No, there's not, but it's still part of my model because that the school looks at it at the end of the day, but it looks at it for other things, all right? So it doesn't have an impact on the grade, but it's still part of my model because I need to consider it for whatever reason. But I know that the R is going to be zero and the R squared is going to be zero. So it's negligible. So I don't even worry about attendance, right? I don't worry about it. But I have my model here that helps me figure out, okay, what's the likelihood or what's, you know, how many people are going to pass my class based on the data I have, right? If I were to put a scattered diagram and plot all your classes based off of, you know, attendance in your grade right now, right? It'll give me a scatter plot and I could build a, a model off of that. Okay, that would tell me, hey, on average, you know, if people are looking to get a 90, they need to have this, you know, be more heavy in this score, and be more heavy in that score, or this one doesn't really hold as much weight, and that kind of thing. Okay. That sounds good. Okay, let's take 10 minutes. Okay. Take 10 minute break, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Liz, you said that a long time ago, huh, Liz? Should have known this. What? You sent me a chat bathroom break. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, yeah, I got back four before. minutes later, so I don't think I missed anything. No, you mm -hmm. didn't. You did all right. I just Wait, really. What's going on? You really what? Um, Doctor Kiss. Ma'am. Um. So regarding the message I sent yesterday about the Excel file, so do we really have to bother about it? Because I, I don't even know what I'll put on the Excel. I don't really have much data like that. What did you send me? The Excel file. 
What I mean, what about it? What's the question? Yeah, they said um, we should submit an Excel file regarding the project. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, yes, right, that's right. So basically, you can make the numbers up. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Real numbers, but there's a lot mm -hmm. of data sets out there that you can use. Mm -hmm. um, data sets that you can download, uh, specifically used for AI. Mm. Uh, they're out there, but the data doesn't have to be real. It could be notional. All I care is about the statistics that you apply to it. I don't right. care if you, to, you know, use data set that says you're talking about people that are 100 feet tall or nine and 900 years old. I don't. It, it doesn't matter. The data, the the data doesn't have to be factual. Um, it, it means it's nice if it's close to you know or related to what you're you know to something, but since it's just a research discussion, you know, it's not, don't necessarily worry about yeah. it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just, just make you make the numbers up. All I Got want you. to say is that you understand the statistical the analysis. statistical analysis. analysis. All right, thank you. Okay. What's up, Joshua? You good? Will you, you, will you work every day? <laughs> Because you, you always come in, you're so tired. Uh, huh? I'm like, Josh was tired every time. I turn around and say, that he's napping. I said, I feel bad for him. I said, let me let him take a nap. Because <laughs> you always wake back up me. And it's like you listening, but you're napping at the same time. I'm like, man, this guy's got skills. He's napping and listening at the same time. I wish I could do that. Once I'm asleep, I'm not listening to nothing. All right. So I was like, just he must got a serious job. I don't sit down much. No. Sit down. Okay. Yeah, what's up? I'm on break. Um, but I'm going to work until I can't joke when I get done. All right. Bye. These iPhones are the worst. I don't know who thought iPhone 13 was great or 14, whatever they have to now. It seems like they get worse every day. So then what? To me, the quality is it's like, not that great. Why? Mine freezes all the time. It just restarts when it wants. It's very annoying. I don't, I don't like it. iPhone 13? Yeah, I had an iPhone 7. I was very happy with it. And then, you know, they start sending you all these updates. I don't have enough memory. So I have to get the new phone, and the new phone is in the work as well. To me, anyway. I don't like buying these phones.
Oh, they got arrested. Who? No, the FTX guy. Um, Sam Free, they arrested him in, in um, Bahamas. 3,000 bucks. How much? 3,000? Sucks. All right, we are back. All right, so another example here. This is significance 
uh, before it looks too inefficient. All right, in this example, they have a power of 0.62. Uh, 0.262 is given as positive, but rather we test our conclusion by conducting a hypothesis test that the correlation is greater than zero. Okay. All right. So again, we set up our not an alternative, and as you can tell, in our primary one, we're saying that the population of proportion, right, um, is less than zero. Our alternative is that it's greater than. Right. Okay, so we know this is a one tail because it has a uh, less than or greater than that. Okay, so that's important too. So if this level is 0.05, we're going to use the t-test again. Uh, now we're going to use the formula decision rule, reject HO if t is greater than 1.653. We got that, of course, from the 0 0.05 and using the n minus 2, they use 180 as the n. So in this instance, the um, degrees of freedom is 178, right? But if you look at the T table, it doesn't go in those increments. If the T table goes basically from degrees of freedom one all the way to 2000 or you know, 2000 just says large, okay? So in this instance, what you wanna do is look at the closest degrees of freedom that's next to the ones you calculated and then use that number, okay? So for our example is 180, right? Our degrees of freedom that we calculated is 170, or 178, excuse me, but there's not 178 and there's no 180 on here either. The closest thing is 200. So we're gonna use 200 and 0.05 or one tail, right? So what is it, 1.653, yep. One tail, 1.653, boom, right here, okay? So we go 200 over here, and then 0 0.05 up here because it's one tail, all right? So be careful of that. Don't let that throw you off. If you don't see the particular degrees of freedom on the table, find the, one that's, find the number that's closest to it and then use that, okay? Um, so 178, go 180, we'll use 1.63 as our critical area, all right? We use our formula to calculate our T, okay? And our T turns out to be 3.622. So there's a correlation with respect to the profits and age of the buyer because it's greater than our critical of 1.653. Okay. So we have to reject the null or we, we yeah, we don't, um, we accept the alternative and reject the null. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's do this there. All right, so we talk about some regression analysis, right? We estimate one variable based on another, right? And so when we talk about linear regression, we're just talking about the outcome as, as compared to, you know, one of the predictive variables. It's basically two uh, variables and we're just comparing them, right? Multiple regression is multiple variables and we're comparing them, but we're just looking at linear regression right now, all right? Regression equation, the equation that expresses the linear relationship between two variables. And when we talk about linear relationship we're talking about if or how they react to each other okay if one does some, something does the other one do something okay that's what we're looking at because it's going to be many relationships where they're not linear right you're going to have uh, relationships like that where you may do something or the very may do something but it doesn't impact the other one right it doesn't have any impact on on anything right they did not correlate in any way or you have a, 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 a relationship, but it's not linear in nature to where it may be, you know, you have to transform it or you have to, you know, do something else to it to make it linear, right? To make it reactive where it's like, hey, all right, if, if X does something, it's gonna affect Y in this way, all right? Sometimes you just don't have that, all right? Uh, independent, independent variable must be interval or ratio scale, okay? So least squares principle, right? In regression analysis, our objectives use the data to position the line that best represents the relationship between two variables, right? Or sometimes what we call goodness of fit, okay? What we want is to build the best model that we can that's going to be as closest to the line, as closest to the linear relationship as we can get, okay? The object is to build the best model. Okay, because you can build a model, I can build a model, who can build a model, model can build a model. Okay, but whose model is the best, right? 
whose model is going to represent the data correctly and the behavior of the data is really what we're seeking, right? Because there's a lot of models out there about a lot of things, right? There's four or five different hurricane models. There's four or five different, you know, economic models, you know, but which one does the best job of predicting the outcome, okay? When we talk about, you know, uh, like even the presidential, you know, uh, results, right? With Hillary Clinton and Trump. The model they used for Hillary Clinton wasn't that great, okay? Trump's model was pretty good, okay? He knew he was going to win. He had a good model, right? Now, we didn't know that back then. Hindsight is 2020, but at the end of the day, now that we know, his model was better, right? Probably the same model, it's just that the different elements of the model, they just signed different weights to it, right? They assigned different weights to it, and so it gave it more credence. So if you're weighing heavy on this particular variable, and I'm weighing heavy on this particular variable, our models are going to say something different because we are valuing different criteria, okay? Just like if we have a model, again, going back to the grades, and I, and I put a value on attendance, all right, but you don't, then when we calculate the grades, they're going to be different, okay? Because you say, hey, Dr. Case, we don't count attendance. Why am I, why, why do I have a B? Well, I, I counted attendance, and I gave you an F on attendance, all right? So that brought your grade down, okay? But you're like, wait a minute, Dad, we don't count that. We have different outcomes because of that, right? So let me see what happens. But you want to make sure that, um, as it says, method that results in a single best regression line, right? The best model possible. Okay, that's what we're trying to figure out with the least squares principle, right? Um, all right, so let's look at here, okay? So again, what we're doing here is looking at the rise over the run, okay? I'm trying to see what the difference is between the fact that one variable does one thing and then the other variable does something else, okay? I want to see what the difference is. Is there a huge difference between the increments, right? If Y moves five increments and X only moves one increment, I want to know what that difference is, okay? What's, what is that difference? What's that ratio that's going to tell me the degree at which one impacts the other, okay? So if Y moves five increments up and then X moves four increments to the, you know, forward, then, you know, they're pretty close. The variance isn't that high. Okay, it's not too different as far as the change, the rate of change, okay? So that's gonna, that's gonna affect my slope, right? It's gonna affect my slope, right? So that's important in the sense that, you know, uh, if, I, if I'm going to school and I'm getting these degrees, right? Is the rate of change the same? Like when I get my bachelor's degree, do I get a $10,000 pay raise, okay? How long does that take? So four years for a degree equates to $10,000 increase a month per year, you wish, <laughs> okay? Per year, okay? When I get my master's, is it gonna go in two year uptick in years of school, what that's going to equate to in income, right? So for additional two years, I get $20,000 increase in pay, okay? But you see the difference, right? Now we're like, okay, now I'm only looking at two years of school and I'm getting a $20,000 pay increase. The rate of change is different, right? So it's going to affect the slopes. So it's going to affect my model. It's going to affect how I view the variables and what is more important and what's less important as far as building my income brackets, okay? So this is how we get pay ranges. This is another thing we use this for, all right? So if we say experience, education, uh, certific certification, location, those all go into the model that predict income, right? And then which one has the most impact on your income? Well, experience and education, right? And then geographic location has a little bit less impact. Um, family status has a little bit less impact. Then, you know, some other things have a little bit less impact, right? But the major contributors to my income are experience and degree, right? So my experience will count for 
my degree will count for 50% and it's 10% that is accounted across the board between everything else, right? So I can account for all the variability within my model and know where each thing is coming from and what goes into the outcome, to my income, right? So that I can plug and play now. So now if I have somebody that comes in and they have 10 years experience, I can predict what their pay is gonna be because all I do is stick that 10 in there for experience and I know, okay, 10 is going to get me this based on the model. Everything else is inputted. And this is what the income is going to be. All right. It's the same thing. Think about it in the sense when you're doing your grades. Really, it's, a, it's the best example students have. You know, because when you start calculating your grades and you look at all the things that go into it, right? LE, RD1, RD2, RD3, RD4, right? And in general, you have a RD average that gets put into the formula, right? That's the mean of the RDs, the mean of the quizzes, the mean of whatever. But now, which, how much weight does each one have? Okay, how much does it count, account for in your grade? At least account for, I think, 30% of your grade. Quizzes account for another 20%. The final may account for another 5 or 10%. See what I'm saying? So now you can understand, like, okay, it's more important for me to do well in the LEs than it is for me to necessarily kill the quiz or maybe even the final paper. I can do okay on the final paper as long as I've done well on the LEs, right? Okay, I can still get an A because the LEs weigh more than the, um, the quizzes. Okay. All right, so least squares regression line, all right? The equation for a line, as I said, Y hat equals alpha plus um, beta X, okay? Or, Outcome uh, is equal to uh, y intercept plus the slope times the x. Okay, so don't get confused about the arrangement within the formula. Still the same thing. Okay, don't get confused about the variables. This is the same as the m that I use, this is the same as the b. Okay, mx plus b, y equals mx plus b. It's just that they've revised the formula to, for different reasons. I don't know why math stuff, I have no idea. But when I came up, y equals mxb was the equation for line. Still the same thing, just different variables, right? So as long as you understand what each component is, the x is always going to be attached to the slope, okay? And the y intercept will always be alone. Just know that. No matter which way they put it, the slope is always attached to the variable the uh, predictor variable, okay? In the y seven, you have your outcome variable, okay? Independent variable, dependent variable, because this depends on this, all right? All right. So now, if we break the formula down, right? So let's just say they just give you some information, right? But they don't give you the slope, right? This is the formula for the slope. All right, for this point B, right? B equals R times the slope of the Y divided by the slope of the X. The rise over the run. Okay, that's all it is. All right? As Y moves one way, X is going to move another way. Okay? So it's basically like calculus. All right? When you're doing integrals, have you guys done integrals before? Okay, I'm not going to go into that. All right? Come on. Um, but what does um, Y do if, to respect to X? Okay, that's basically what you're saying. It's yeah. the same, right? Why is that formula right here? It's because you need to formulate the 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 um, the, the slope, all right? I mean, the, the design is X equals oh, it's just yeah, that, that, that's that's you have to figure. How could no interval to at least know the no, this, one this, of the respect of facts? No, but this no, this part is not this, this is I'm just explaining that because I understand a little bit better. But this is basically saying, hey, y is doing this, x is doing that, and we're comparing them. Because that's what division is. We're comparing them, right? What do you call it again? That's the like the a throw of interval, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't remember what integral it is. Yeah. I just know it's an integral. I, I learned that after. I learned that in calculus class. Yeah, yeah. 
told you that your hat are on. I express respect to always respect to ice. It's yeah, it's it's um why in respect to X, right? Because whatever X is doing is going to impact Y. Right. right. So I have to consider what X is. What do we say called implicit? Implicit. It yeah, may be, I don't know. Maybe. I just know integrals in general. I don't know all the different kind of yeah. Like the chain rule and all that good stuff. I don't remember all that stuff. But either way, you don't have to worry about it. All you have to do is they say, hey, I calculate my R. I I see what my the slope is for Y. I see what my slope is for X. Plug them in, run my formula, right? So it's basically the Y divided by the by the X. That gives me the change, the rate of change between the two. Okay. And I multiply by R, it gives me my um, slope. Boom, put into the formula. Okay. And I come back here, my Y intercept, alpha equals the mean of the Y's minus the slope times the mean of the X's. Okay. So everything you, you need is basically is going to be listed out in you know in the little table on in your data, right? Basically, once once you have this, you can formulate everything, right? Again, going back to the core of statistics, the mean, the average is the center of the universe when we talk about statistics, right? You get the mean, you get the standard deviation, everything else you can do once you have those two pieces of information, all right? So once you get that, kind of go back. All right, and then you say, hey, I want to build a model, All right? This when I say build a model, this is what I'm talking about, a predictive model, because I know this is my outcome, whatever it is, okay? And don't forget, like, it's, it's general nature. The outcome can be anything you want it to be. This is just a representation of it in a theoretical sense so that you know that, hey, it's a variable. I can apply any name I want to it, okay? This could be the outcome of, how many shoes I wear a day, right? Equals, you know, my y intercept plus my slope times the x. It does, doesn't matter, okay? This is the general formula, right? Get your slope, get your y intercept, you're good to go. All right, so you can see here, okay? Um, find the slope of the, uh, the least squares regression line B, okay? This is the R that they calculated. Uh, this is the 12.89. That's the, the slope for the y. This is the slope for the x. Okay. Boom. You divide them, multiply. This is your new slope. Okay. Alpha equals y, uh, mean of the y's minus uh, the, the slope times the mean of the x. So 45, okay, minus uh, 0.2608. If you calculate it here, times 96, all right? x is whatever that score was. Then equals 19.996, 96, 19.96. Okay. So now I know my y intercept, my alpha, whatever it was in the formula, or B, or whatever they want to use this time, this part. No, yeah, this part is that. Okay. And this is my slope times the x. Okay. So now they can use this to predict any number of calls or any number of, you know, copy or so, right? So in the example, you see a sell person makes 100 calls, how many copies should I expect them to sell? Well, I would take my 100 and I would plug it in right there, right? Because that's my X. And then I would calculate the outcome, okay? So this is what you're building. You're building a model. Now you have this. You can calculate any number of calls that come in and you can tell me exactly how many copies I'm gonna sell. If I sell, if I make 200 calls, right? If I make 200 calls, how many copies am I gonna sell? Okay, easy. Well, is, that, is that part of the question or you, you just make an explanation? Yeah, the 200? 100, yeah, the 100 calls. The 100 calls is just something they, arbitrary number they just picked. They just said 100 calls. Yeah, and that represents the X. The 100 calls represents the X. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I'm now asking, is, it, is that part of the question or you just try to make it, you know, to explain to us? Yeah, no, this is part of the question. So basically- so the, the question will give X. Right, so the question will give you an X. The question, yeah, or it may give you an outcome. It may say, hey, there's 46, I sold 46 copiers. How many phone calls did I make? Okay. This, this is what you this is what you're trying to do. You're trying to build a generic formula that you can apply to any variable, any data set, and say, hey, you know, because you consider this a score. This is this is basically a score, all right, or a value. So somebody in the company made 100 phone calls. Tom made 100 phone calls. How many copies should I expect him to sell? Well, according to our formula, 46. Okay. So now if Tom made 100 phone calls and he hasn't sold 46 copiers, then I can kind of go to Tom and say, you know what? You're kind of below average. Or if he sells 50 copiers, like, oh, Tom's above average, right? Because based on my formula, you made 100 calls, you should sell 46 copies, right? But it's all based off of looking at the rate of change between the two variables, right? <laughs> and analyzing the old data. That's actually what I'm doing. Kind of now, mm -hmm. I'm selling solar leads to a solar company. Right, okay. And the problem they have was the lead is not converting. Yeah. It's an intangible yeah. sale. So, yeah. so they got a bunch. Their, their cost for, uh, what their cost for sales is they pay me for lead. Mm -hmm. So that means if they make a hundred call and they didn't have any sale, or have very few sell lower sell than predicted. Right. And my lead is not. You need not a fit. Yeah. yeah. So I have a you know, if they know what they are doing, they will just come back to me and say, "Hey, your lead is not as valuable as other people's lead. Right. It's worth something else. Mm -hmm. So lower your price. I'll give out some free leads. Right. To justify that. Right. And I'm actually in the middle of doing that. Yeah. Figure out that the sweet spot. Yeah. But there is. Uh, I want to swear, but uh, uh, so th there is this person at, this, at their company that's saying, hey, there it is, it's not converting, which is Canva, just can this vendor. Right. A vendor that's waiting to work with you on pricing, mm -hmm. but you, you want the least quality at the price. Right. So what are you paying your salesperson for? Because they're yeah. not paying salesperson for a call, mm -hmm. they're paying them for a conversion. For a conversion, and right. I have to call more. Right. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's the debate between the two companies. Right. And and you can even you can even hit them with the central limit there when you can hit them with the large law of large numbers. The yeah. more calls he makes, the higher chance he has of hitting a certain sales goal. Yeah. Right. The more calls he makes, the more likely he's going to sell more. more okay. Because you give yourself more opportunities. All right. At the end of the day, it's gonna all balance out. All right. It's normal distribution. Perfect. But Huh? That if the call goes to the right place. Well, this know. this is where the conversion thing comes in that Moose talking about, right? Because I give you a lead, it doesn't really mean anything to me, right? Till I can convert it into a sale. I can if I can't attach it to a sale, then it's 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 a dead lead. It's it's a waste of time, right? So if I'm paying Moose ten dollars per lead, right? I'm expecting the lead to generate a certain amount of revenue, and if it's not doing that. Then I need to figure out a move like, hey, but these leads are dead. Can you give me some more leads or throw me a couple for free? Like when we're doing trying to find and he's trying to figure out like what's the right amount of leads, which type of leads are going to work towards getting them a conversion, right? And this is where he has to really look at his formula and say, okay, this type of lead only attributes to only accounts for 10% of conversion. So I need something that's going to give me 50% or 60%, you know, certainty. So I give you the lead and say, hey, look, these leads are good. You call them, you, you know, do about 100 calls per person. You're going to get 50%, 60% conversion, all right? And so all this stuff, you know, it, it goes into, you know, a lot of business decisions about leads. This is why it's very important um, that companies, they're collecting data on all of us. Because you can't really do this without a lot of data. Right? Because I need to know, you know, who you are, your habits, your patterns. 
I need you to build a regression for each person. That's what you're really doing, building a unique model for each person. I know if mom goes to the store or, you know, for instance, mom normally has a coat on, you know, she had a head covering on, you know, she always comes in first, sits in the back, right? All those elements contribute to the outcome or whatever it is, right? Her being in class, let that be the outcome, okay? And so I can start building a profile, but I need data. I need her to come in every week to class. So now I can start building a profile, right? I understand you, I understand you, I understand you, right? Just like I was talking to you, like every time you come to class, I see you taking a nap, right? That's why I asked you, hey, hey, Josh, you got a job, mm -hmm. right? Because it starts to make me think about, okay, why is he, why is he tired? Why, you know, what's going mm -hmm. on? Maybe he's just tired. Maybe he has narcolepsy. I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, just, I don't know. But I'm asking, right? And it helps me build a profile. Now, you're a good student, right? Because I've noticed that that doesn't affect your grade. So for me and your model, man, he comes here, takes a nap, probably his only quiet time. I'm okay <laughs> because his grades are good. See what I'm saying? Your grades are fine. So I know that the outcome is not affected by you taking a nap here. All right. Or oh, by you coming late or mom, you know, showing up in a coat and, and just being, you know, chilling and quiet or move, you know, whatever, or Liz or anybody. Okay. I I know, I understand that, but that's what we that's what they're trying to do. That's what big data is about. Collecting as much information as I can so I could build a profile on the customer so I can build a model so I can predict what they're gonna do. I'm trying to predict behavior. Buying consumer behavior, right? Person behavior, all right? Understanding that Christmas is here, all right? And how people are going to behave. I already know that, right? Because I have decades, centuries of data on Christmas, all right? I know people's purchasing power, but I know also after Christmas is done, come January, all the prices are going to drop, right? And more people are going to go buy stuff because now there's all these sales and all this other stuff, right? And that's really the aim of all this, really, for companies anyway. Is to build a profile on you to understand you as a person. All right. So we got the regression line, right? So at the end of the day, all right, when we are looking at, you know, all this data here, and, you know, here they have their the different value points, right? X equals 40, Y equals 30, X equals 120, Y equals 51, all right? So different data points, right? Each of those, I would plug into the model, right? This, and basically, this is how they got these scores, okay? I basically know at 40 copies per soul was 30.3952, okay? At 120, I, I know I know that, you know, Y is going to be 51.5 or 25, okay? So let's look at this example. These squares equations can be drawn on a scatter diagram. For example, the fifth sales representative, Jeff Paul, he made 164 calls. Estimate number of copies sold is 62.73. The plot X equals 164. The outcome is, or the Y hat equals 62.73 is located by moving to 164 on the Y, on the X axis, and then going vertically to 63.73, all right? Other points in regression equation can be determined by substituting a particular value of X into regression equation and calculating Y. So basically all they're saying is, hey, once you've got the model, you can calculate any score here, okay? So now, They've got the sales rep, the number of calls, right? They can determine the number of copies sold, which leads into estimated sales, okay? So then based on this, I can say, hey, we're at the six month mark. You are currently at $40,000 in sales. Okay, you need to pick it up because on average, my sales folks made $120,000 in sales. So if we're at the six month mark and you only have 40, that means you're more than halfway away. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna have to pick up the pace on your calls. Because if you wanna make that 120 and get that bonus, the other 40, 50 grand, right? You're gonna have to pick up these calls because we need you to sell more copiers because that has a direct impact on your income, right? You can go to any car dealership. This is how they do it. Commission, this is how they do it, okay? On average, how many cars does it take for a salesperson to make $90,000, $100,000 a year? 
and talking about like regular cars, not luxury cars, just regular cars like Toyotas and brand new ones. Huh? Brand new ones. Brand new, brand new, use it, man. Okay. How many cars you think it takes Five. per month? To make ninety thousand to a hundred thousand dollars a year, either revenue or profit. No, I'm talking for individual person. Like, let's say if I had a list of people here, right, car dealers, and I would say, okay, based on the number of you know people you talk to, right, and you you know want to make hundred thousand dollars, how many cars do you think that person would have to sell? Five cars per month. Five cars per month. Yeah, about like what five, three, four, three. Four. What do you think, Elizabeth? How many cars? I don't know. One million cars. Yes, take a guess. Take a guess. Oh, Nikki, what maybe, do you think? Four cars, I'm not sure. Four cars. Ricky, what do you think? Four thousand. Four thousand? Golly, man, you never <laughs> going to <laughs> Gonna be at the car dealership all day, Ricky. Right? On average, if you're at, you know, if you stay within a certain, you know, mid are, mid uh, range, you know, so Toyota, you that kind of thing, that, huh? Like, if your price are like 30,000. Yeah, between 30 to 40 grand, right? For for car now, that's about average, right? 30 cars a month. 30 cars a month? 30 cars a month. 30? Okay. Yeah. Most dealers, most dealers make or sell to make a hundred thousand dollars a year as a salesperson no, sales are you talking about their profit or you talk about the value no i'm talking about i'm talking about their salary their yeah salary. that was what was like yeah is it the commission or salary so that's a car a day yeah 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 i got confused too like yeah no, yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking about your salary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So your salary is directly related to your sales, right? That's what confuses us. Yeah. So if if you have if you're selling thirty cars a month, you can expect about a hundred thousand dollars in salary. Yeah. All right. Between it, if you're selling cars at thirty to forty thousand dollars a piece, right? But again, that's why I said make sure you stay within a certain range of cars. Because it varies, right? That's not the same for Mercedes or BMW or someone who works in a Lamborghini. Right. 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 Well, no, not really. How many Lamborghinis do you think it takes for a guy to sell to make $100,000? Well, how many Lamborghinis do you think someone sells a month? Lamborghini sells. I'm saying, how many How many you think on average? Probably less, maybe one or two. Less than one. <laughs> one. It, it depends on the zip code, I guess. It, it, yeah, no, that's good. That's that's true. It depends on the zip code, but for the mm -hmm. most part, most deal dealers that are at Lamborghini dealerships or high end dealership, one every six months, one you know, two two a year, maybe yeah. if they're lucky, right? Mm -hmm. But they're gonna make a hundred something thousand dollars. Right. Okay. Right. Easily, right? So that's why I was saying stay in that range. But if you're talking about regular mid-sized cars, thirty to forty thousand dollars takes about thirty cars a month, right? And if what's anybody know what the average sales for a car dealer, a car dealer is? That's for when I well, let me let me rephrase that. Um, what's the question I was asking? Um. <laughs> How many, how much do you think, how many cars do you think, I forgot the question, it'll come back to me. It, it, it's still mind boggling for me. You need to sell a car every day to pretty much make a decent living at the car sale. Yeah, but that's still not bad. $100,000 selling 30 cars. I mean, how, how many hours does it pay to, you know, Sell a car. I know. So in my experience, if I walk into a dealership, it probably take me all day to just get a car from test driving to a drive on the yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it depends on the customer, right? If you come in and you already know what you want, it's a pretty quick process. If you come in kind of open-minded and like, okay, I really don't know what I want, I kind of know the style, but I don't know what I want specifically, it could take a little bit longer. But most mm -hmm. people that come to car dealerships. 
they already know what they want. What they want, right. The longest part about being in a power dealership is usually the financing piece. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So right. signing the paper takes time. Right. Half yes. a day, right? It, it used to. It doesn't take that long anymore. It's still hours, though. Well, it takes longer like, than I think. Like I think. three, four hours? Four hours, yeah. It's, it's longer than I think it should take, but it, it used to take, you're right, days. And you take a day. You spend the whole day at the car dealership trying to buy a car. I bought a car off the internet. They ship it to my house. All I need to do is sign all the paperwork. Yeah, you're good. Mm -hmm. And that takes four hours yeah. for them to, for me to just sign everything, everything, yeah. everything send them, approve it, mm -hmm. send back. Online. Yeah. Yeah. Online. Which makes sense. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Uh, right. But if you go to the car dealership, nowadays it's different. It's, it's a lot faster. Okay. And then we have people that go with, with pre approved financing already. Right. So if you have pre approval, you go in with your check and you, you know, you don't tell them how much you have. Okay. You just say, hey, I want to buy a car. And they go, okay, you need financing? I'm like, no, I'm good. Lot. Yeah, I'm good. All right. And okay, cool. What kind of car are you looking for? All right. Well, I got this. I don't like this one. You got one with different color. That's really what takes the longest yeah. time, you know, getting this yeah, stuff. Yeah, when you you're not sure what you want, it should take a long time. <laughs> a long time, right? But that's why you should go in with your own financing. All right. You should get a pre approval from the bank. That way you have your budget, you get the best interest rate. Right, because the car dealership is not going to give you the best interest rate. Okay, it's going to be right. the highest interest rate right. for the most part. And most car deal, most car dealerships don't have their own financing anyway. And mm -hmm. a lot of time, if you don't use their house financing, it's a different price. It's a different price. That's right. Okay. Well, no, another price. price. Yeah. So it's it's you know it's a very interesting business, right? And they don't make much profit margin on the cars. Car dealerships okay. don't make money on the cars. Where do they make money at? Uh, animals like a service yeah service maintenance that's where car dealerships make their money maintenance maintenance changing oil add-ons yeah they make money in maintenance what do you guys buy and i decide not to do that decide not to do what to do my service from the, the maintenance from from them yeah you go to whoever you want because I, I can buy it later and I have my mechanics. Yeah, that's up to you. But you just know if it's a new car that you're going to void the warranty. Right? If you let somebody. I was going to talk about the warranty, like you're going to lose it. Lose the warranty, right? Because you let somebody else work on it. That's not Toyota. Right? So that's what they get you. Okay? So, I mean, but you see all these different programs on cars, right? Hyundai has a 100,000 mile warranty. Or I don't know, five years or whatever. BMW has four years, fifty thousand mile warranty, right? It's forty thousand. It's forty thousand. Yeah. All right. Thanks, big money. Um. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, for BMW and, and and all these all these different car companies, they're trying to build these packages to attract consumers to them, right? And have given the most miles that they can, but they look at all this stuff statistically first. Right, there's the reason why they pick a certain number 100,000 miles, 50,000 miles because they know once it gets to 101,000 miles, that's when it's going to break. <laughs> okay, statistically. statistically speaking, yes, we have a pretty much 95% confidence that the car is going to break at 105,000 miles. Right, this part's going to break here. Right, cars are built that way. Okay, believe me, I used to work for Toyota. <laughs> They're built that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're built to break. Because they need to make their money. Because that's where they make their money at. But then the GE used to make light bulbs that never go, go bad. Yeah. They still they realize that's our biggest problem. We need to uh, make them worse. We need to create the need. Huh. We need to create the need, right? Because there is a light bulb that never goes out. Huh. There's such a thing. You'll never see it on the market. Because that will kill the industry. Not gonna happen. Um, all right. What time is it? 7:43. Okay. Um uh, well, I'm done. Yeah. There's a lot more, but um Make sure you go in, look at the rest of the slides, There's about seven or eight more slides, but they mostly have to do with confidence intervals um, and stuff you're not gonna, you're not gonna do.
for the most part. Right yeah, you can use you can do an Excel, but usually we usually don't go around building confidence intervals for the most part or prediction intervals for the most part, right? What I really want you to understand is you know uh, the R and the R square and then the, the the slope of the Y and the X, right? And be able to one um, determine what your correlation is, right? Your R. And once I get my R, then I can build my model. My Y equals MX plus B or Y. You know, I can, I know how to do, build this, right? So, right, I got my R. And once I get my R, I can build this, right? But in order to get the components of this, I need to know what my R is. That's the importance of the R, okay? And understand what R is and understand the different outcome or dependent variable, Y intercept, right? Slope and predictor variable, okay? All right, any questions? I didn't think so. <laughs> All right, well, it's, it's been a joy and uh, I really appreciate you guys. And hopefully I get to see you in another class that's not statistics. You know, mm -hmm. this is a very, it's a much more interesting class than all my other classes. Okay, my other classes are very boring. Mm -hmm. Oh. Who wants to talk about HR? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Next course, HR. My no, friend. you, are you? You have no, HR? My friend. Oh, okay, yeah. I teach HR. Are you taking HR next course? Uh, people don't talk. No. So we don't. None of them. But MBA, not DBA. I teach DBA in charge too. Oh, okay. yeah. Next course, you have? Uh, no, I have master's in yeah, charge next course. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The DBA oh. uh, is a. That's uh, a very global. interesting course, the HR in the MBA. I did it with um, Professor Judith Balian. She made yeah. it so interesting. For once, I didn't dislike HR people. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's a fun, interesting topic. It just a lot of people don't really care about HR too much. Yeah, I told you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, just make it fun. Global HR. Yeah, it's no, it's fun. It's global. Global HR is fun. I mean, all HR is fun to me, but I can see where a lot of people think it's boring. All right. Um, have a good night, Professor. Thank you. Okay, see you later, Ricky. All right. So get all your work in. All right, don't make me work have too hard. Work too hard, you know. I'll be in New York next week, so. so I got we are not going to come to class. That's it. We're done class. Wow. So our presenter is going to be on the video. Today is the last yeah. day of class. Uh -huh. it's, yeah. It's going to be individually. Yeah. Or... For your paper, for your final project, yeah, it's going to be your paper yeah. okay. and then a video PowerPoint presentation. All right. All right. Make okay. sure you have a PowerPoint with your video, and you you know you're presenting how many, it. How many minutes do you? Uh, I don't know, Joshua. Ten minutes. Twenty minutes. <laughs> don't go. No, don't go over more than ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah. Then um, you want us to go. No, but the assignment on the page says thirty minutes. No, don't worry. Just Dr. do ten Case minutes. just wanted straightforward, short, good quality. That's what he wants. Straight to yeah. the point. Yeah, don't give me a bunch of fluff and stuff I got to watch all the way through. Do you right. want us to follow the format you gave me? Was it week five? Or four. For presentation? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, go with the format. Go with the instructions that are on oh, week eight. But for the most part, it's the same. All right? You want to talk about your paper. Um, and the way I would recommend you doing it is breaking up by sections. Intro, lit review. Methodology, yeah. discussion, conclusion. Keep it that findings, simple. conclusion. It's simple, right? If you're doing a qualitative study and you don't have any specific data set, right, then you can talk about the trends or the things you found, you know, buckets or whatever in your qualitative study, because that's what you're looking for when you do qualitative research, looking for trends or, or you know, groups of, of common things. And you can talk about that, okay? For your, for your, as far as your um, methodology, all right. But that's why we keep it as far as the, the PowerPoint. Wouldn't go too much different. On the Excel sheet, you expect on the bar charts, you know. Yeah, use bar, bar charts, histograms, 
you know, uh, you can use scatter diagram, you know, depending on the test you're going to run on your, your data, right? So I would, I would recommend for your data, you run, you know, a correlation and you run an ANOVA. Because if you run an ANOVA or if you run a regression, they, they all kind of output the same, right? If you do an ANOVA, you're going to get a linear regression output also. If you do a linear regression output, if you do a correlation, you're going to get the ANOVA out also. But at the very least, you know, do a correlation. That way you can say, hey, there's a relationship here. And then say, yeah, this relationship here is weak, strong. And then maybe it's, you know, for further research, we can look at it because there's some validity there. You can call it a day. Don't, don't go too deep on, you know, on trying to do a ANOVA. Even though it's, it's pretty simple, it's just that when you get to the explanation part, you got to explain more about it. And correlation is, is good enough for what we're doing in this class right now. Because when you get to your real dissertation, right, you may have to do a, a You're going to do a regression, right? You're going to do a NOVA, but all those things are kind of wrapped in already together. When you do one, it gives you the results for all the other stuff. So that way, they kind of build on each other. So if the NOVA is showing significance, then the um, regression should show significance. This correlation should show significance, okay? So it should all build with each other. It should all correlate and connect um, and support each other, all right? Because you may you may end up having to do some kind of sequential, you know, equation modeling that you don't want to do. It's ugly, 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 baby. It's very difficult, all right? Yeah, it's, I keep it simple. You know, keep a couple of research questions, keep a couple of hypotheses. Don't go reinventing the wheel. The whole point here is just to get the DBA done. Okay, when you get your DBA, your doctor, whatever, you can do whatever you want, right? Well, you can rule the world. Yeah, right? I, I'm hoping when I get my DBA, I start to prescribe medication to people. <laughs> no, there's no, there's no. There's no MD in the DBA, okay? There's no MD, okay? <laughs> no one needs to know. No one needs to know. Liz, Liz I don't want to visit you in prison, okay? <laughs> it's, not my, it's not what I want for you. Thank you. Good. We enjoy your class. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Dr. Kiss. Thank you so and much. You there, right? Happy holidays. Who's Happy going? Happy holidays. Home? Everybody yeah. staying here? Yeah. Staying here? No, not stay here. Not stay here? So you're gonna go back home? No. Oh. You always stay here. Oh, now? Yeah, for for, for the holidays. No, stay, stay, stay here. here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Ma'am, good night. All right. See you guys later. Bye. Bye. Good night, Joshua. I'm letting you go today. Uh, <laughs> good. Goodbye. Bye. We'll keep one of the later. Thank you. I'll see you guys later. Okay. Safe trip back to New York. All right. Thank you.